Good day, everyone. It's nice to see people coming in. And as we've reached 50 participants, I think it's a good moment to start this session. Welcome. My name is Bart, Bart Weiss. I work for CARE. Um, and I'm pleased to introduce you to our session on our adaptation finance tracking methodology. In the past uh, two years or so, we piloted this, piloted this um, methodology in six countries. We worked with partner CSOs in all of these countries, and um, we've been tracking over 6 billion of adaptation finance over the period 2013 to 2017 to these countries. As far as we know, it is a unique research in its sort. Um, I'm happy to hear if you have other thoughts on that after this session. Um, let me give you a few uh, remarks or guidelines for engagement in the session. I see people saying hello in the chat. Very good, because that's what we were hoping you would do. Um, please introduce yourselves in the, in the chat. Um, say hello, uh, share any questions that you may have and stay on mute for the time being until I um, open the uh, yeah open the floor for questions. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, we have a Zoom volunteer standing by. So uh, then please um, put a request in the chat to the, to the volunteer. I hope at least you'll be able to access the chat. Um, a quick overview of what, you'll, what to expect for this session. We will start with a short poll to get, get a bit of um, an idea of what your background is and also your expectations for the session. Then um, I will give you uh, an overall introduction to our methodology. We'll have some time for questions and then we'll go into our cases for Uganda and the Philippines. And then we'll have some breakout groups with the researchers from these countries where you can ask them basically any questions that you have about the research, the methodology. And um, finally, we'll come back in the plenary. We'll have a sneak preview of the, uh, the overall outcomes of our research. And I will then close. And then it should be um, one and a half hours more or less from now. I would like to ask our volunteer Chandler to um, share his screen with the Mentimeter poll. Let me stop sharing. Can we go back to the first slide? This is the second one I see. So you can see the instructions at the top. Please go to menti.com and then you can use the code 70577744 to log in and um, answer the questions that we share here. Yes, I see the first person found the link. So you go to menti.com and use the code, please. It's 70577744. By the way, we are recording this session so that we can share, um, yeah, so that people can listen back afterwards just so you're aware. So we have 30 people uh, more or less answering the question and you can see an overwhelming uh, majority of NGO colleagues here, some research institutions, two governments and one business, one student and one other. So uh, that's, it's quite clear that we are among peers, which uh, I suppose is nice, but also happy to have some other people around so that you can offer some fresh um, and different perspectives. 
Can we go to the second question, Chandler? And have a look at the word cloud. Great, it's nice to see this developing. It's nice to see also that I think we're, um, that you're in the right session because we'll be talking about adaptation finance and we'll indeed be hopefully sharing new things um, helping you to broaden your knowledge um, to get um, a better understanding of adaptation finance and how to track that. Good, well, Feel free to keep on adding expectations. We'll be saving this cloud afterwards. So it will become part of the, um, the package of materials for this session. In the meanwhile, I'm going to start up my presentation and walk you through our methodology. Go to full screen. So the basic purpose of our adaptation finance tracking research was to assess whether donors reporting of adaptation finance is reliable and accurate and whether the full amounts genuinely, genuinely target adaptation. In addition, we also investigated if the adaptation finance benefits the poorest and most climate vulnerable parts of the population. And we sought to develop a methodology that civil society could use widely. We initially piloted this in six countries that you see in this um, overview. The, um, in Ghana, uh, Uganda, Ethiopia, Nepal, Philippines and Vietnam. The scope of the research so far is that we've investigated 112 adaptation projects in these countries. We focused on international, international adaptation finance from bilateral donors and the multilateral, um, the multilateral donors or the development banks. Then we included in each country the 10 largest adaptation relevant projects in our sample. In the total, we covered almost half of the total climate finance received across these countries throughout the period. Why, why is this study needed? Well, for one, I think most of you will probably be aware of the, um, of the Paris Agreement and the, and the agreement or the, um, the intention declared in the agreement to have an, a balanced uh, approach to climate finance balanced over adaptation and mitigation. And by most people, this balance is interpreted as um, that the 100 billion or 100, yeah, 100 billion climate finance should be 50% uh, um, adaptation finance and 50% climate finance, uh, mitigation finance. So in order to track that, um, there's basically two methods that are used to, to report on adaptation finance. And both of these methods have their issues. One is the Rio marker, which is used by developed country donors in reporting to the OECD. And it's a very rough estimate because it's just a marker one uh, or zero, one or two. And based on that, the calculation is made of how much of a project budget can be reported as adaptation finance. Most donors say that if Rio marker zero is 0%, obviously, um, Rio marker one is 40%, so it's a bit less than half. And Real Mark 2 is 100% adaptation finance. If you look below on the slide, um, you, you can see that if a re, for a real marker, um, for a project to get a real marker 2 on adaptation, the, ad, the, ad, the climate change adaptation objective should be explicitly integrated into the documents for the activity, but, and it should also be 
a fundamental reason for the design. So basically, um, the project should not be there if, if, no, if, if there would not be no need for climate change adaptation. Then for um, the real marker value one, the, object, the objective of the project should be related to adaptation, but it is not the primary reason for undertaking this activity. And then finally, of course, if the, there is a real marker zero, then it's not related to adaptation at all. And then next to this, there is the method that's employed by the multilateral development banks, which is um, called the three-step method, which we are going to use, or which we used in our methodology actually, actually. But the disadvantage of this one is that it's totally non-transparent. Um, the banks do not disclose uh, how they exactly assess their projects and, and the evidence of that assessment. So as civil society, for example, we cannot dive into that and, um, um, and investigate whether they are indeed assessing their projects correctly and whether that adaptation finance is indeed, um, can be judged to be adaptation contributing to adaptation. In our methodology, we um, started with OECD DAC data for the six countries that, we meant, that I mentioned for the period 2013 to 2017. This is data that is reported by the donors. So it is all based on project documentation and the real markers, and then the, the three-step approach for the NDBs. We used then our, um, our own uh, variation on the three-step assessment based on these development banks, because um, in our view, the questions that this, these three steps ask are, um, yeah, are relevant questions to indeed assess whether uh, finance is contributing to adaptation. And because it's, it's, an, it's um, a method that's also being used by the donors themselves. In our research, we combined document and observational analysis, which is one of the, um, the contribute, yeah, one of the things that we, I think this research contributes to the evidence on adaptation finance. And we used a rating scale, as I um, show on the right hand side in this slide, to come to a granular, granular calculation of the adaptation relevance of the project. I'll show a, a picture of that in the next slide. But basically, um, and with this scale, we, we gave scores to each of the questions for the, the three steps. And then with these scores, we calculated the adaptation relevance of the finance. And then we also included in our methodology an assessment of the poverty and gender orientation of the project. So in a way, um, the first part of the, 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 the research focused on the quantity of adaptation finance, and then the second part more on the quality, in which we same to do, and we, um, we did a rapid assessment to what extent the project includes poor communities, a gender assessment based on a CARES gender marker, and um, an assessment using the joint principles for adaptation, which will probably be familiar to some of you because um, it's been developed, it was, they, these joint principles were developed by the Southern Voices um, as principles for yeah, adaptation, good practice, basically. These are the three steps in assessment. Um, the, the first step or the first question, basically, or yeah, the, the steps basically translate into three questions. One focuses on the climate vulnerability context um, and, and questions how well the project sets out the context of risks, vulnerabilities, and impacts related to climate variability and climate change. Then the second focuses on the statements of, statement of purpose or intent in the project document or in the project. So is the intent of the project explicitly to address the identified risks, vulnerabilities, and impacts related to climate variability and climate change? And then finally, is there a demonstrated direct link between the risks and vulnerabilities and impacts and the financed activities. And um, for each of these steps, we basically, um, we, our, our assessment format took the form of a table in which for each step, we, um, we assessed on one hand, what, what, when looking at the project documentation, what, 
what SCORI would give. And on, on the other hand, we combine that with observations. Observations from sources um, from the areas where the, um, the projects were implemented um, or um, other relevant uh, additional sources that we could find. And we did this because we, because on one hand, um, the donors themselves score the, or, or judge the adaptation relevance of project purely based on project documentation. So we wanted to replicate that process and, and see whether we would come to the same conclusion. But on the other hand, we also wanted to see whether in practice, um, reality would actually confirm then um, the, the assessment of the project document. And what I'm showing here in this table is basically an example calculation where um, you could come, where, well, in this case, we come to the conclusion based on our assessment that, um, uh, let me see, for based on, so that there is a difference, you see a clear difference between project, our assessment based on project documents and project observations, where in actual observations, we come to a lower estimation of adaptation finance, but also um, that linked to that, um, if you, uh, if, if our, according to our estimation, adaptation finance is only around 65% or 50, 56%, then it would not be correct to give a real marker one, or sorry, a real marker two. So what this led to is basically, um, sorry, no, I'm going too fast. So the next slide, and I'm going to sh show this very briefly because I cannot share all of this with you, but so we also had um, these assessments for poverty, gender, and the joint principles for adaptation. And basically these were separate elements in our methodology where we, um, where the teams in the countries assessed poverty and gender and, and the joint principles according to a number of key questions. And then again, um, coming to an assessment rating. In the end, this led to a maximum of 20 reports per country on 20 projects. Um, and then these 20 project reports were uh, synthesized into country reports. And we are currently finalizing the overall synthesis report. It's almost done, so we can share some first findings uh, later in the session, but we're still looking for the, yeah, the best or the, yeah, the best moment to publish it because, of course, um, all, yeah, the whole agenda of the UNFCCC is um, shifting, and um, so we're a bit puzzled, yeah, puzzling to see what's the best moment to reach the right people. Any suggestions on this? Welcome. Now, some first lessons, and there will be more concrete lessons shared by my colleagues later. Um, the first lesson is that the access to data, and that's obvious, of course, <laughs> that is crucial. And it's not always easy for national civil society. So, for example, for um, our colleagues in Uganda or Ethiopia to access these. In our study, this was facilitated by a consultant in Denmark. And what we saw is that the collaboration between NGOs and the expert consultants was crucial for the result. So I think um, in developing this methodology and taking the, um, with the ambition that it could be widely applied by civil society, we underestimated the importance in, um, of having this access to data and also having this expert insight in um, that's needed to calculate, for example, or to, yeah, to crunch the numbers. And it's, we also found um, that our methodology is still quite complex. I think that's probably also what you, what you, what you conclude based on my presentation so far, mm -hmm. because it has a number of different elements and these elements need to be better integrated. And similarly, the rating scale where we had 10 different grades uh, should be simplified to five points, actually, because it's difficult to distinguish between um, 10 different grades. And then finally, our conclusion is that the combination of document and observational analysis does have a great added value, because we found that from our observational analysis, we come to 
different conclusions than uh, from the documents. However, to get that observational evidence was more costly than we expected. Um, because what we expected initially was that through uh, contacts, um, through networks, uh, CSO counterparts, we, we would be able to reach out to people by phone, for example, to investigate, to, to ask them about the, their knowledge on the, the implementation of a certain project in an area. And that turned out to be more complicated than we thought. Um, it turned out that in many cases we did need to go uh, visit areas ourselves or our, col or my, uh, or our CSO colleagues did, did so and um, organize focus groups, for example. So um, it turned out that this observational evidence was, was more difficult to gather than we had expected. These are some of my, uh, the first lessons and, and, and um, uh, a brief description of our methodology. I imagine that you have questions based on this um, and we have some time for that. I would like to focus though on, on really on the clarifying questions and save any uh, discussion for later. Let me just see if there's any questions in the chat. And meanwhile, I'll stop sharing for a minute. Let me see. So I'm going through the chat now. I see one question on poverty orientation and the poverty cutoff points. Um, let me see. I must admit, I don't have the direct answer to that. Maybe one of my um, fellow researchers has uh, an answer. Because we follow, we used basically four simple questions to uh, look at, to assess the poverty orientation. Oh, yes. Christine, please. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, but for the presentation. In regard to the poverty, we used the four questions and we also used the existing uh, poverty maps. We used the World Bank uh, map for Uganda. Then we also used the household survey reports. So those formed the yardstick for determining which projects were actually responding to poverty and being guided by the four questions on whether the project did the poverty analysis, whether it is um, taking into issues of inclusion. So that is what we basically did. Thanks, Christine. We'd be happy to provide a more detailed answer afterwards if you can, um, if you want to have that, then please just reach out. I'll share my email later on also in the chat. Let me see, I see another question on what basis this research considers the finance as climate finance. Um, that's actually not so difficult because we basically used the OECD DAC uh, report climate finance. So the basis in this case is um, what the donors themselves reported as climate finance to the countries. And then what we did, of course, is check whether we indeed agreed that this is adaptation finance. Maybe also good to add here that we focus on adaptation finance because this is, um, it's, it's easier to measure uh, mitigation finance generally. And it's also, um, so there's, and it's easily, uh, in it, no, it, it's easier to measure the impact of mitigation generally. So in what we've seen in the past is that there has been a tendency to focus more on mitigation also because mitigation is, um, is easy, there's an easier return on investment. So we focus our study on adaptation finance because we, crit because we also saw the necessity to draw extra attention to adaptation finance and, and because we had the, um, we have the, the assumption or the, the hypothesis that adaptation finance is actually being overreported. So that what we mean is that, what I mean then is that, that um, 
a lot of the current reported adaptation finance doesn't really count as adaptation finance. Okay, let me have a look, a last look at questions. The countries involved were Uganda and um, Ethiopia and uh, Ghana, and then Nepal, Vietnam, and the Philippines. So knowing how much adaptation finance. This is a good question, uh, which I which would also be good to bring out in the break, breakout groups. Is knowing how much adaptation finance is reaching communities really more important than knowing the adaptation or resilience impact of that finance? And we in part try to address this question by also integrating the poverty and gender components into our assessment. But of course, um, that still is uh, an assessment based on how the, the, the project is set up and not so much on really um, the real changes in resilience that we see at community level. That was also a step too far for this research. This was focusing on public funds. Ah, I see you already answered my question on, on the question on the countries. Okay, um, let me see. I think a number of these questions I see here are very good questions to also ask the researchers in the uh, breakout groups. So what I would like to do is go to the presentation of my colleague from Uganda, Jalia, who was doing the research in Uganda for Emily, together with Christine and probably some other people. Um, and you will tell us more about the research in Uganda, uh, your findings there, and also uh, what, some of, what are some of the lessons you learned on the methodology. Jalia, can you sh share your screen? and unmute yourself. So let me see. Jalia, can you hear me? Otherwise, Athena, would you be Okay, to go first. Ah, I see Jalia starting to share her screen. Okay, Jalia, can you? Um, put the yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon from Kampala, Uganda. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Good afternoon. It is a good afternoon from Kampala, Uganda. My name yeah. is Jalia Nambiru. I work with Emily. Emily is Environmental Management for Livelihood Improvement by a Facility. We are based in Kampala. I work as the programs officer. I'm glad to be sharing with you the findings we got from our study. Let me, let me start my video. Let me present as you see me. Yeah, this is a, a snapshot of, um, of our findings. By way of overview, uh, for some of you who might not know, Uganda is a least developed country and categorized with low human development index. That is according to UNDP 2018. Uh, according to the ND gain matrix, Uganda is ranked as the 15th most vulnerable country with that ranking of 0 0.58. Uh, we note that Uganda submitted our national adaptation plan roadmap to the UNFCCC in 2015. Uh, <clears throat> by way of uh, doing this assessment, we assessed a total number of uh, 701 projects. Uh, which were totaling to 1 billion USD. 
that is between 2013 to 2017. Uh, for the projects that we assessed, uh, we are 21 in number to a tune of uh, 495.1 million USD. But uh, we looked at um, German as being the largest climate finance provider during that period we assessed. Uh, in, in our findings, we observed that 55% of, um, of the 495.1 million USD of the total that was committed was adaptation related. That is what we found out. And we went ahead to find out that 43% of the adaptation finance did not address gender equality. Still, we saw that 16% of the total received was remarked as principal for both mitigation and adaptation. As uh, Bart has already alluded to it, the donors themselves do report their commitments that is on climate change adaptation to the OECD real marker. So we focused on the database by the OECD. That is uh, the information, that is where we got the information. Uh, we also found out that uh, 57.4 million USD of adaptation finance was found to be underreported. Here we note that uh, some donors do report and uh, the recipients of that money from the donors do report again on those projects. So we found a mismatch in reporting, which we, we identified as underreporting from the two entities. Uh, we go ahead to, to share with you some of the issues that we found out as very key. Uh, but has already alluded, alluded to some of them. For example, the limited transparency on project information. We found out that uh, most of the donors do not um, expose the information related to their commitment of projects. So it was a very big challenge for us to find um, information related to projects yet they are reported in the OECD real marker database. Uh, the inaccuracy donarium marker allocation across projects, that one has, has already been noted. We also looked at the limited focus on adaptation projects, that is in relation to gender equality. Gender was not um, a, a, a very good focus in relation to project uh, development. In some of the projects that uh, we managed to go and visit the sites, we found out that um, some projects have been delayed. The implementation has been delayed uh, due to some um, bureaucracy, maybe from uh, the implementers, that is uh, from the government, uh, from um, and other uh, other CSOs that were involved in the implementation. Uh, in line with the lessons and, and key outcomes, we note that capacity development on the tracking tools is very crucial. Of course, um, but as already mentioned, that the tool seems to be complex. Yeah, <laughs> we all agree to that. So we need some uh, continuous capacity development in line with those tools. Uh, we also note that transparency on project information is important. This point speaks so well with um, the point as I have already alluded to, in line with um, the, the limited exposure of uh, uh, project information. Uh, we also note that there is need for a fair understanding of the country policies, plans, and strategies on adaptation. Here, <clears throat> we observed that some of the projects that were assessed were not um, readily linked to the, the project, to the Ugandan policies, plans, and strategies related to adaptation. So this has to be a very key thing that should be taken into consideration when developing projects. Uh, we see the multi-stakeholder engagement as a very, a very key thing. This takes into consideration um, the state and non-state actors uh, because for some of the projects that we managed to go to, some did um, engage the communities, 
which was not the case for other projects. But still, we note that this is a very key thing which has to be taken into consideration. Uh, our next lesson here is in line with the agenda action plans, which should be integrated in project documents. Uh, we note that gender is very key. And of course, um, as care, we know very well that um, our themes are very well aligned with the gender action plans. So here we note that gender action plans should be integrated in project documents for it to be taken uh, very good care of. Uh, we found out that uh, some of the projects did not um, do gender analyses. Uh, we found out that um, in some of the projects that we visited, uh, some gender, gender groups were not considered. For example, we visited a project in, in Kabale, that is the Eureka project, and we found out that uh, women were assigned roles that were too heavy for them, they could not manage. So we think that um, gender has to be split and uh, considered very well in the project documents. Uh, that is from um, inception, implementation, implementation rather, and evaluation. Yeah, in terms of outcomes, uh, we saw that we built state and non-state actors capacity in tracking adaptation financing. And we also developed a database of 21 adaptation projects. Um, uh, so to speak, and for your information colleagues, our government was very much um, appreciative to the study. So when we developed this database, it was taken on by the government and they will be using it um, uh, whenever they will be qualifying adaptation projects. In terms of building uh, capacity, uh, if I can report to this congregation as Emily, we've gone ahead to continue with the tracking of adaptation finance. Uh, this year, 2020, we are continuing with tracking adaptation and mitigation. Uh, from uh, last year's um, assessment, we, we got a number of questions as to why we are not involving or including mitigation. So this time round, we managed to widen our scope to include mitigation in our assessment. But this builds from the experiences we got from this assessment. I submit. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dalia, for sharing your um, uh, lessons and findings from the, the work in Uganda. And it's really good to hear that you are continuing the work uh, and updating the findings for the, the years after 2017. And also that the government is also so engaged in this. Yeah. I don't want to lose much time, so let's go to the next presentation. Athena, are you ready? Oh uh, yeah, hang on. Dalia, can you stop sharing your screen? Thank you. Uh, and can you enter full screen mode, sorry. Athena? Yes, uh, perfect. Sorry. Hello, guys. Oh. Wait, hang on. Uh, Ah, there. Hi, yes. hello. Can any, everyone yes, can hear me? Yes, we hear you. All right. Um, so I'm Athena. I'm the researcher for, for this adaptation finance tracking for the Philippines. I work with Assistance and Cooperation for Community Resilience and Development together with um, ICSC and CARE Philippines, of course to undertake the research. Um, my partner from ICSC is also here. So later we can just, if you have more questions, we can answer them for you. So basically, um, of course, as you would probably know um, from this typhoon and earthquake um, profile from the Philippines that we are at, definitely at risk to hazards. Um, we rank fifth in the climate risk index um, as of 2019. And then we are definitely prone to extreme weather events. And we have felt the slow onset effects of climate change, specifically for like um, the second largest 
um, island in the Philippines, Mindanao. Uh, El Nino was really bad last year and it has led to a lot of food insecurity in the region. Um, we do not have, we have climate policies, but we currently do not have a national adaptation plan. It's supposed to be developed uh, this 2020. Um, when we were doing the research, we were, we had CCC, the Climate Change Commission, together with other government agencies and um, a CSO representation, discuss about um, a database. Uh, the Climate um, Commission in the Philippines said they will be establishing a climate finance system and services, which will hold all relevant climate financing in the Philippines and, that's, and hopefully track um, climate finance. So that's still to do, something to do for the government. Um, so far, uh, there has been, there is 623 climate related projects from within 2013 to 2017. But then specifically for this project, we only reviewed 18. So the criteria we used were, um, well, we looked at the largest projects in terms of financial value. Um, of course, projects that also scored one and two for adaptation. And we also tried to include some of the projects, even if they weren't, um, even if the financial contribution was, wasn't a lot, we tried to include some, gen some gen um, projects with gender markers. So yeah, the largest donor, at least for the Philippines so far, is Japan and the World Bank. So what we found out during the research is that um, a lot of climate finance in the Philippines still leans towards mitigation. Um, and apparently, a lot of the climate finance is also um, primarily through loans. Only 7% are grants to, to the Philippines. And then that there is also a lot of over-reporting. If, if you if we go back later, we can just discuss it also in the breakout groups. The methodology, the, the tool that we used in the three-step approach, we found out that a lot of um, donors are over-reporting. And because Japan is the highest donor or the largest donor in the country, we found out that 54% is over-report. 54% is just, 54% is, is estimated to be generally adaptation re relevant only. And then, of course, one, one key issue was that gender was not a key objective across all projects. Only six projects, at six out of the 18 projects scored in, in gender. So that was a key issue um, across all projects. Um, the key lessons we found out in the use of methodol the methodology was that, again, similar to Uganda, we had very, it was very difficult for us to access project documents and to access the projects themselves. Um, we had to str do different strategies across partners, across ICSD and Accord, in order for us to get, just get you know, um, documents from, from agencies or, or local governments. Um, it, it was evident also that whoever was thinking, I, whoever was um, doing the study or reviewing the project, there are inter-rater biases in how we scored. So I think similar to Uganda, we think that building the capacities of researchers are very, very important to ensure that there's, um, to minimize inter-rater biases. And then um, again, similar to what, uh, what do you call this? Um, Bart said earlier, the tools are very, still very, very complex and it's, it's a lot of work. So it requires a significant amount of time and resources to finish it. And then um, as a suggestion, of course, we discussed it also with the team um, last year. I think it's better also to use participatory approaches to make sure that the researchers are not just like academics or people, you know, CSOs, that also local communities are also, um, the, the capacities of local communities are also built for them to be able to participate in the actual data production. So they can also track the projects themselves because these projects are supposed to be the ones that, you know, will impact heavily on their lives or would reduce their risk to climate so climate change so yeah so there sorry am i speaking too fast sorry guys no it's perfect athena thank you it's good yeah. to hear your experience as well and um um and i'm looking forward to 
going into depth on these projects further in the breakout sessions. I have set up a number of breakout rooms. Each will be led by one of the researchers involved. And I invite the participants to basically share all their burning questions and um, uh, with them then and, uh, and discuss those. Um, let me show you quickly a Google document with the questions that I set up for this, where we aim to capture the outcomes of the breakout groups. You can see my screen now. And basically I've created a number of tables with the questions. I'm totally fine if you only discuss question one, <laughs> the first question and go into the burning question, but please take notes in the group of the questions that you ask and also um, in the answers in bullets. It's not necessary to be very uh, comprehensive. The facilitators will be the ones, uh, will be our fellow researchers. And um, I'm going to ask you to, at the start of your um, breakout group, do a quick round and also see who is willing to take notes. I will share the link to the Google document in the chat right now. So you can all access this. And I just need to find my chat, of course. Where did it go? There. Sharing the link. Oh, I'm sharing it to everyone here. So I'll send you to the breakout groups now. You'll have 15 minutes. Do come back because we will be sharing a sneak preview of the overall findings afterwards. And of course, we'll have some time in the plenary to close together. Hello, Thank welcome you. back. Thank you, but I am not finished. Though. I understand that you haven't finished. Yeah. <laughs> There's probably a lot to, to discuss and um, I think this is also a limitation of this format, that we have a methodology that's complex and a lot of experience. It's simply, and it's not possible to share all of that in um, the time that we have. But we do hope that this is, it works as a teaser and um, we'd be happy to share more afterwards if you get in touch with us. I would like to ask the different breakout leads to briefly update me, update the, the group on what you discussed in your, um, in your breakout. Shall we go through the groups just oh. one by one? But can I start first so I can? Yes, leave? please, Christine. Yes. So in our group, uh, there was a question on what is, how are you able to, to differentiate over-reporting and under-reporting? So in our group, we've been able to touch the over-reporting and under-reporting, whereby if the budget that is reported to the OECD is higher than what is um, being estimated by the assessment team, then that is, that is over-reporting. And we also tackled an issue of, um, uh, we tackled an issue, there was a question on how this study is going to, is relevant for future, for future work. And we noted that uh, the study is relevant, tracking adaptation is relevant, because by then we shall be able to try to hold governments and providers of climate funds accountable by looking at the impact of climate finance at the ground level, and also be able to trace how much has been committed by the development by the developed parties. Then on the issue of the recommendation, uh, members suggested that the methodologies should be made easier to be worked with. And then for the lessons learned, uh, it was learned from members that gender aspects should be integrated in, pro in project designs from the word group to be able to track and to be able to, uh, to ensure that the projects are gender responsive and climate finance is considering gender aspects. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. Um, can we go to the group by, with Jalia? Yeah. Please just briefly in a minute. Okay. 
I mean, yeah, thank you, yeah. Bart, and thank you, colleagues. Unfortunately, in our group, we just managed to cover question uh, one, uh, but um, the time was very limited. Uh, moving forward, we discussed about um, the issue on transparency in line with project inform information. And here we, we were wondering, or members were wondering, how we manage, how we can manage to trace money uh, that comes from an agency to an intermediary uh, up to communities and back maybe the reporting back to the donors. How do we uh, like put a distinction between all those um, entities or among the entities? Uh, we also discussed um, about the methodologies being used in tracking finances. Wow, we indicated uh, the real markers, the JPAs and poverty maps in terms of uh, poverty and the gender care marker in terms of gender. But uh, still here, we also focused on gender as uh, something that should be explicitly included in project development. Uh, one uh, member inquired about how we can differentiate between mitigation and adaptation finance, noting that um, uh, a donor can give a money wholesomely but uh, the actions, some of them can be contributing to mitigation and adaptation. How do we differentiate? And maybe, yeah, we didn't go, we didn't go further because uh, time was not on our side. Thank you. Thank you, Jalia. I understand. Um, let's see, Andrew. Maybe you can update me shortly on your group. Yeah, so we had some good questions on how the research can be used um, as an advocacy tool in budget tracking. Um, and I think that the main point there is that <clears throat> currently climate finance towards the Paris Agreement targets is very uh, dominated by the, the donors who mark their own projects and report their own finance. So some kind of mechanism using this method or a version of this method to be able to fact check these donor numbers is the main way that this can be used as an advocacy tool and the global findings that we'll come to in a bit kind of support that and um, then we had a question on the differences in the amount that gender equality was targeted and here we found that a lot of projects didn't really have any gender focus and um, there was very few projects that that um, stated that they were focusing on transformative gender action. Um, yeah, I'll keep it short and leave it there. Thanks, Andrew. Athena, can I ask you to go next? Sure. Um, ours was, we didn't finish quite well there, but then we, the first question was that, was it possible to compare data between countries because the processes might be different, that are, we, we delve into a bit of poverty, whether we can compare poverty indicators across countries. Um, we said that we, we try to simplify poverty and even gender by just asking the, the four key questions that we did. And we had a workshop to discuss their findings together and try to come up with general patterns and trends. Um, there was also a question on whether there's a linkage between the gender scores if you score high on gender, would you score high on adaptation too, or, or poverty? Um, what we found out across is that there's no, no clear pattern yet. So far, even those that scored high in gender, sometimes they don't score high in adaptation as well. So um, there's also a question on, um, was it difficult to access documents? And yes, we've said this earlier, it was very difficult. And, and we, I think across countries, we did different strategies just for us to get the documents and have, have a look over them. So we, we had advisory groups, we tried reaching out to national government agencies, local governments, communities, everywhere. And then, um, so yeah, those are the burning questions so far. That's all we finished. Thank you, Athena. Kairos, you are last. Okay. 
Hi again. I, I finished mid sentence when you called us back to the <laughs> to the main plenary. Uh, but where we, we we talked about some interesting issues in the group, uh, issues that are sort of uh, lying in the in the borders of the methodology of. Uh, we talked about you know looking into localities. I mean we we sort of. I mean, the research uh, looked into the international flows and how it's implemented in the local level. Uh, Sakib from, from ICAD asked, you know, did the research try to look into, you know, the difficulties and, and what it actually takes for localities to access financing, uh, climate financing? And I think that's, that's interesting, uh, but it's not explicit in, in the methodology of the research. Uh, Shelton asked about uh, did the research come across any corruption issues, which I think is important, uh, especially in, in some of the, in a, in a lot of countries. Uh, we also talked about uh, whether there is an experience where a fund is not necessarily tagged as adaptation, but then we uh, looked into it and decided that it's, you know, it's actually good. It's, it's actually an adaptation measure on, on, on the ground. And we, I just shared one of our experiences in the Philippine uh, research, where in, you know, a a fund uh, flow what is, isn't tagged as an adaptation measure, but it's actually used as an adaptation in in, in the local implementation. So that's uh, I think that's that's uh, an interesting uh, question. Uh, and and last is you know similar to most of the groups is a. Uh, what are the main reasons for having difficulty in getting information? And I think that has been answered uh, several times, uh, especially on the on, on the grounds that you know it, it really varies from from country uh, from one country to another. So these are all important, uh, I think, supporting studies or lens on climate finance uh, that this research would also benefit from uh, in the future. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. It's interesting that you point out that we need, in some cases, you, we also found underreporting. So, the, the, the example that you mentioned of a study or a project that wasn't tagged as adaptation finance, but which you in practice found to be contributing to adaptation, is an example of underreporting. Ah. Andrew, I think we're coming to the point that we, um, we all would like to have a sneak preview on what are some of the global findings from our uh, study. Let me put up your PowerPoint and then yeah. can you walk us through? Yeah, sure. It's just a slide. I'll go it's just a slide, right? Yeah, let me just. Without revealing any of our, uh, <laughs> our big numbers pre-publication. Pre okay, just a minute, I'm trying to. Yes, here it is. I'm, tr I'm starting to appreciate people helping out with all the technicalities around these kind of things. Once you do it them yourselves. Okay, it's on, uh, it's, it's on the screen. You should be able to see it now. Yeah, I think we can. Yeah, so um, I've been involved in pulling together these um, six country reports and looking at the figures at a more global perspective. And there's a few things that we can pull out in, in terms of global findings. And that's um, in general, adaptation finance is being, it's far more likely to be over-reported than under-reported. So, um, and it's really substantial um, across the six studies we're looking at over-reporting figures that run into billions of US dollars across these uh, four reporting years, five reporting years. Um, so when you take into account this over-reporting, uh, then these donor numbers that are being reported officially to the OECD and the UN in their biennial reports, they can be considered unreliable. And we say this because we've looked at 112 projects across just six countries, and we're finding figures that are this large. So if this method was to be repeated elsewhere, then we think that these figures could change quite substantially. So that can be linked to things like the UN Adaptation Gap Report, which 
looked at and tried to estimate adaptation finance needs by 2030. They put them at about, about 140 to 300 billion per year. And then if you look at what the OECD is saying at the moment in terms of how much donors are providing, in 2017, the OECD recorded 13 billion of adaptation finance, which donors reported themselves. So if you take this low amount that's already being reported and then factor in over-reporting and then look forward towards adaptation needs, then this adaptation gap is widening and might be being underestimated. Um, and then if we look at the issues on transparency, then we're seeing that um, bilateral donors, the developed country donors, are particularly um, bad at providing access to documentation. And the multilateral development banks, um, although they do provide documentation, which is an important distinction that came out from across the, the six studies, was the banks have public public uh, registries of their documents, um, but they don't provide information on how they make their figures. So this transparency issue is across all six countries. And then as we've just heard from the breakout sessions, gender is not being uh, integrated consistently. And that was a finding across all six studies. And um, from the rapid assessments on poverty, we're seeing um, patchy integration into these adaptation projects. So it's not, um, you know, the, the, the gender and the poverty analyses, they were more rapid and we were looking at how the donors are integrating it into their documentation and also some observations. But there is, there's, for those to be considered as integrated consistently into adaptation projects, there's a, a lot further to go. So all this is to say that um, this role of this, this civil society organization to act as watchdogs on adaptation finance, we think has been proven as, as necessary and um, should definitely uh, continue, should keep going. Yeah, I'll leave it there, but. Thank you, Andrew. I must say, I'm really tempted to open the floor for questions still and final remarks, but looking at the time, we simply don't have time for that. I'm, I'm, uh, I was really happy to be able to share this, this methodology with you and the first findings of our research. We're excited to be able to share the findings in the foreseeable future. Um, again, uh, we need to still figure out what's the best moment. If you have any thoughts on that, please share with us um, or any intelligence on who to, to reach out to. One of the target groups for this research, uh, especially the overall report, we thought would be the developing country negotiators uh, so that they have a very clear picture of the, the potential uh, over-reporting that's actually in adaptation finance. Um, Again, as, as Andrew sh shared, we think that this report, though we, 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 we on one hand um, encountered challenges in doing the research and doing uh, ac accessing information. Um, also, um, it's, it's really challenging to, to investigate these very large uh, infrastructure projects, for example, in the Philippines. Um, but it also for us really highlighted the role of civil society and the need for civil society to be somehow um, watching, uh, investigating these projects to indeed assess whether they are adaptation relevant, whether um, so the, whether re the reporting makes sense, and also whether they are addressing gender and poverty, um, because we see that there's gaps and we see, so we it really underscores the necessity of um, transparency and civil society involvement in assessing these projects. And I think there's a long way to go there. Um, and a lot of, uh, of our lobby and advocacy efforts will go into, into that as well. The good thing also, and maybe but that's on the side, it's very easy, of course, to, call, to talk about over-reporting um, and, uh, and, and point fingers, but there's also a number of donors that are doing quite well. Um, so we see that a lot of the over-reporting comes from a few donors, which uh, 
is, is good news for some, I suppose. And, um, and in some cases, there is case of underreporting. So there's also adaptation finance that's not being reported as such. However, the overall tendency uh, or the overall conclusion in our research is indeed that there is much more overreporting than underreporting. We will be sharing uh, the recordings, we'll be sharing the presentations um, of the session afterwards um, through the CBA. Um, I think that's it from my side. Thanks again a lot. Maybe a final suggestion is that we turn on our cameras so that we can actually see each other and um, wave each other goodbye. Please stay in touch if you want to. I'm now putting my my <laughs> it's good to see you all putting my email address in the chat so you can reach out to me Thanks. so goodbye enjoy cba i um hope you'll learn a lot and uh, share a lot and um i hope we'll be in touch thanks all for joining and thanks a lot for the team. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you.